a pleasure welcoming you to our Grand Rounds in June. Um, we have a monthly celebration of orthopedic highlights in front of our Grand Rounds uh, here in this location. And uh, twice a year, uh, we have uh, special guests uh, from outside of UW Medicine uh, who present uh, their thoughts to us in one of those special occasions today with our visiting professor. Before I introduce him, let me just uh, do what we usually do and reflect on a couple of outstanding colleagues who've been mentioned. And the first one is uh, Courtney O'Donnell. Uh, she did an absolutely beautiful job, was responsive, collegial in the emergency department, timely rapport with families and practitioners. She stands out in professionalism and teamwork. So here's a shout out for Courtney. A recurrent uh, mention is uh, Dr. Tim Alton. Um, Tim, you again did an outstanding job. Um, uh, with uh, several others, I never felt treated better uh, than when I came and saw uh, orthopedics on 6 Southeast at UW Medical Center. So here's a shout out to you. And Dr. Madsen's team, again, and Dr. Lee, Dr. Huang, and Dr. Coleman got special commendations uh, for their outstanding care. So uh, our thanks to your outstanding care. Uh, an organizational note, the 2013 Resin Research Day, our graduation, is uh, June 28th on Friday. And this year, due to construction, it's going to be at the Wright Auditorium in Seattle Children's uh, Medical Center. So we have a distinct uh, and distinguished visiting professor in Christy Weber. And our residents have already tuned, I think, their uh, research presentations for that occasion. Um, she is known to be very sharp-witted. Um, in terms of other organizational announcements, we'll have um, a um, new Grand Rounds printout, thanks to Kenny Gundel, who's terrorized a lot of you. Um, in the very near future, and I want to thank all of you who are contributing to next year's academic curriculum, and I think it'll be a very exciting program again. Um, one other shout out, by the way, I forgot to mention that to Kenny Gundel since I talked about Grand Rounds. He's gotten the um, Clinician Scholar Career Development Award, so give him a hand. I would like to use this occasion to introduce uh, to the larger group also uh, our latest new faculty arrival dressed rather spiffily in the front row, Mr. Bruce Twaddle from Auckland, New Zealand. So give him a welcome. As I said in the beginning, today is one of those special days in our academic curriculum where we have a visiting professor. Um, and uh, today we're really honored uh, to have Dr. Vaz Masri here from the University of British Columbia. Um, he is the professor and chairman of orthopedic surgery there. Um, he has a uh, very interesting background. He was uh, originally from the Lebanon and came to uh, Canada in, uh, I believe, 1981. And he has a, a Bachelor of Science in Chemistry in 1985. And he graduated uh, with a Doctor of Medicine in 1988. He did his residency in the same location, 89 through 1994, and then embarked on a dual fellowship training in orthopedic oncology and uh, then in, uh, at the Hospital for Special Surgery and Reconstructive Orthopedics. So he did oncology and uh, total joint replacements together. He stayed at the same location. as again one of those amazing academic success stories. He has contributed to the literature dramatically. He has over um, 200 scientific presentations. It says here 178 peer-reviewed published articles and 47 book chapters. Um, I've been amazed when I looked at a CV at the bandwidth of his publications, which really go from the uh, ultra basic sciences uh, to large scale systems analyses. And I think today we'll be privileged to see an example of how a single person can make a huge difference in a rather complex system. And I think it's no insult to our Canadian friends uh, to say that their healthcare system was not known to be one of primary patient orientation and flexibility. And this single person, as a joint surgeon, looked at how the system was impeding <coughs> the ability to handle healthcare and how this could be changed uh, to make a larger, better output for the patients. So it's with a distinct uh, degree of appreciation and pleasure to invite you to the podium, Vaz. Thank you for taking the trip down and hopefully have a good trip up. But thank you for giving us your insights and how you fought this battle and didn't turn it into a battle but a success story. Thanks very much, Jens, uh, for this very kind invitation, and uh, thank you all for having me today. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, just a couple and a half hours south of Vancouver, we're so close, yet we're so far. We uh, don't really do a whole lot together. So my task this morning is to talk to you about how uh, we have contributed to improving efficiency in joint replacement, and here are my disclosures. 
We all know that demands for joint replacement are rising. Patients are having better life expectancy. And with the improving outcomes of joint replacements, nobody's really too young or too old. One of the things that uh, we had to really struggle with when I was doing my uh, fellowship exams, when I was finishing my residencies, what do you do with a 50-year-old with osteoarthritis of the hip? Are we going to do a hip fusion? Or are we going to do a hip replacement? And if I'm going to do a hip replacement, how can I justify it? Well, luckily, we don't have to think about these things anymore. Patients are not accepting of anything less than almost perfection. The Canadian system is very different from the system here, and all sy systems have their pluses and minuses. Our old philosophy in Canada was, and it was when I first started practice, these things are too expensive, implants are too expensive, we need to control the implant budgets, and many of you might have heard of the old system where you had an X million dollars or X hundred thousand dollars for implants. At the hospital, as soon as you run out, you shut it down and you go on vacation. And uh, at many places, come October, you can't do any more total joints, so if you're a total joint surgeon, you go on an extended vacation or you do something else. Or the, what they also try to do is to say, okay, we're going to cap your billings. Once you achieve a certain amount of billings, that's it, you're done. Or if you're starting out in practice, we're going to pay you 50 cents on the dollar. And if you're willing to work at 50 cents on the dollar, go ahead. So what that, had, what, what that accomplished is rest restricted access for patients and contributed to very long wait lists. So the consequences were patients were waiting longer. The public started to complain, they started to vote with their feet, and they started moving out of the system. They started coming down here, and 10 years ago, a lot of patients were coming down to Bellingham, to Seattle for surgery. Then they discovered that India was cheaper, and then they started going to India, and then we started dealing with the complications from medical tourism. And that also made us, as medical providers, complacent. So if the wait was two years, so be it. That's life. You know, deal with it. Suck it up. In any government system, and I'm sure you're experiencing a part of this now, and uh, some people might agree or disagree that what Obama is trying to do is good or bad, but the solution cannot be more regulation. It cannot be draconian approaches to targets that cannot be met. It cannot be paying lip service to what the solutions ought to be. And you can't cannibalize other services. So in other words, you can't just say, today, we're going to focus on joint replacement and let's forget about shoulders, and then shoulders can wait, and then tomorrow we'll focus on shoulders, but we'll let joint replacements wait. So you, you can't rob Peter to pay Paul, and you cannot have uh, penalties in a system without incentives. This is something that every Canadian patient and provider talks about, the wait lists. So we have a wait from the time you have your symptoms until you see your family practitioner, that's typically not very long. Then you have to wait for investigations, and sometimes an MRI, depending where you go, can take up to a year, sometimes can take up to a month. Whether you need it or not, it doesn't really matter. Then after that, you're referred to a specialist, an orthopedic surgeon, it takes time to see the orthopedic surgeon. So we refer to all that, wait A, B, and C is wait one. So the, the first time waiting until you've seen the orthopedic surgeon. Then after you've seen the orthopedic surgeon, you go on a wait list for surgery, and that's wait two. So the federal government decided that controlling wait lists was not optional. So in 2003, the federal government met with the premiers of the various provinces and the health ministers of the various provinces, and uh, they had the first minister's accord in 2003, and then they decided that by 2010, no patient will be waiting for more than a year for any surgical procedure and less than 10% of patients will be waiting for more than 26 weeks. Initially, they focused on joint replacement cancer treatment. Obviously, cancer doesn't apply 26 weeks because you'd be dead. Uh, child psychiatry, MRI. And now, it applies across the board. So although healthcare systems differ, in any healthcare system, the basic premise is that we need to achieve access for all. And services have to be avail uh, available and portable between different sites, individuals, etc. And in a system controlled by the government, be it Medicare here or be it Medicare in Canada, you have to apply the principle of justice, the, the various principles of justice. So everybody has to be treated based on their need, not based on their capacity. And while many might disagree, physicians remain the cornerstone of the healthcare system. Without physicians, the system will fall apart and fail. 
but there are competing interests in any healthcare system. Patients have their own idea of what they want, and there is a disconnect between wants and needs sometimes. Community services and advocacy groups have different competing interests as to what they expect from the system. Public administration of the system also has competing interests. They, if you need to please the voters, because at the end of the day, what you want to do is renew your mandate and get more votes, while at the same time spending as little money as you can to maintain what the patients want. And you've got the hospitals uh, that are perhaps competing for resources and are trying to not run a deficit or make a profit if it's a private hospital. And at the end of the day, what we really need to do is improve cost, uh, improve care and reduce cost to get value. And as the economies are potentially shrinking and as the dollars aren't being stretched as far, we need to do more with less. So as you can see here, healthcare uh, spending in the US is increasing at a rate that is alarming, that is higher than, than anything else, that it's higher than wages, it's higher than the economy is expanding. And the only bit of good news is that over the past year, there's been a slight reduction in the 5.9% increase per year of healthcare spending to about 3%. And that's perhaps related to the economy, to the slowdown in the economy as opposed to the true uh, healthcare spending. Canada is the same thing. So our growth rate is 6% per year, very similar to the US, except the difference between private and public spending is different. In, in the US, 80% is private, 20% is public. In Canada, it's 80% public, 20% is private. And also in Canada, over the past couple of years, there's been a slight slowdown in the rate of spending, primarily because of the economy and because of governments <coughs> We, we have conservative governments in British Columbia and federally, and luckily they're not willing to increase taxes to support more and more spending. And quite frankly, people are a little fed up with increased taxes. We've uh, enjoyed for the past decade the slight reduction in taxes. When I first started practice, I was paying 54% of my income in, in income tax. Now it's 44%, so that 10% makes a difference. So what Einstein once said, that problems cannot be solved by the same level of thinking that created them in the first place. So traditionally we've thought as physicians, and somebody practicing in Canada, is give us more money, we'll do a better job. Just throw more money at the system, and we'll spend it, and then we'll treat more patients. And that will give us better quality. So look, let's look at the healthcare cost as a percentage of GDP in uh, the Western nations. The US tops the list at 16%. And you can see uh, Canada is at 10%, Australia, New Zealand is approximately 9% or 8.7%. So if we look at life expectancy, we see that the life expectancy in, uh, in the US is 78.3%, in Canada it's a little higher, in a, uh, or as Australia, New Zealand is a little higher, Canada it's a little lower. So the life expectancy isn't necessarily correlated by the amount of money you're spending. So what you need to do is have a system that is spending the money wisely. <laughs> and the paradox that we have is that we have increasing costs in healthcare uh, that is completely out of pace with the economy. We've got new technology that may or may not be appropriate. Uh, we are potentially having to practice defensive medicine when we don't need to because of competing interests with uh, lawyers and with patient expectations. And this is not sustainable and the demand is rising. So for us, a solution wasn't optional. We had to find a solution to deal with the backlog of patients. And clearly, you can't create something out of nothing. You can't just take thousands of patients and operate on, on them for nothing. But you gotta do it more wisely, and you, you gotta do it at a lower cost per case. So in Vancouver, at least in joint replacement, we introduced two approaches, and that's the OASIS model for management of osteoarthritis of the hip and knee, and the Center for Surgical Innovation, which uh, we started in 2006. I'll go over both of them as to how they contributed to solving both that weight one as well as the weight two problems. So funding in healthcare of healthcare in Canada is tradi traditionally by the provincial governments. So the Ministry of Health of the various provinces tells the health authorities of the hospitals you've got an X million or billion dollars to spend and do with it as you wish. So with that, that's what's called global funding. And then that gives you a variable output. So the best way of spending global funding is to have a whole bunch of money, pay a whole bunch of people to do nothing, shut down the wards, shut down the operating rooms, 
and I produce nothing, and then you've got a surplus. You're not really spending anything, and then the CEO of the hospital will get rewarded because he or she has had a surplus for that year, and everybody's happy. But then that leads to problems and to wait lists. So when you look at this picture here, is this a duck or a rabbit? So at first, it looks like a rabbit, but is it a duck? So what we have to do is have a paradigm shift as to how we think about funding, how we think about spending money. So for the first time in my own, my own recollection, the Ministry of Health issued a request for proposal for joint placements. So they have they finally decided that in a public system, we're going to turn it into an internal private system where people compete for resources and they compete to get cases done. And if you can do it more cheaply, you're going to do more cases. So that enabled the physicians to say, okay, I can do, do it better than you. And the administrators say, say, we can do it better than you. Let's get, let's get those resources. So when that RFP was issued, nobody believed that the minister was actually serious. They said, no, we've never done this. We've never actually had to compete for work. We've, we've got way too much work. So why should we ever compete for work? So no health authority, and there are six or oh, five real health authorities in the province, and one that doesn't really provide joint placement. And a uh, health authority is basically a health system. So in Vancouver, we have two health authorities for a population of two and a half million. So each covers about one and, one and a quarter million people. So Vancouver Coastal, where I work, and it covers uh, basically urban Vancouver as opposed to suburban Vancouver, issued a proposal to do 2,000 additional joint placements, initially in Richmond, which is a suburb of Vancouver down by the airport. And the ministry said, fine, we're going to give you $22 million to do 1,600 cases. So when the money was issued, all of a sudden they really didn't have a plan. So I received a phone call and said, we've got $22 million to do 1,600 joint placements. And we thought we were going to do it in Richmond, but there's no capacity in Richmond. We can do it at UBC Hospital, with which is the, the main hospital on campus, but that hospital had been decimated over the years because of previous thinking that let's cut, we can't afford to run hospitals, let's shut it down. So that hospital became a surgery center that does nothing but outpatient surgery. So in February 1, 2006, uh, we made an announcement. I, I was with the Minister of Health, made this announcement. On February 2nd, I had to have my ACL done. So uh, I had surgery the next day, and we had to do the first case on April 3rd of the same year. So we set up a, a bunch of task forces, work groups, to rejuvenate the hospital. We had to hire nurses. We had to hire physical therapists, occupational therapists. We had to get the rooms retrofitted back with oxygen because we didn't have oxygen. We had to buy beds. We had to build two new operating rooms to accommodate the extra work. We had to. Uh, get a new SPD because the SPD wasn't capable of handling the work. In fact, we didn't have a running SPD when we started the, the program. We had a school of dentistry on campus, and then we would shuttle instruments back and forth from the school of dentistry because that was closest to SPD while we are building a, a new SPD department that could handle the workload. And then we did do the first case on April the 3rd, and then we did do our 1,600 cases in the first fiscal year, and then we did it under budget. And I'll talk to you about how we did it and, and what impact it. So at the same time, we started this OASIS model, and that's the Osteoarthritis S uh, Services Integration System. And what it is, because patients are waiting a long time to be seen, so that's still a wait. So we wanted to eliminate that wait as well as minimizing the wait for surgery. So we set up a system by which any patient can be seen by an allied health professional, so it's an advanced practice physio physical therapist or a nurse. And they get screened based on criteria that we set out. You know, if, you, if your Oxford score is X, then you need surgery. If not, then you don't need surgery, and so on and so forth. Now, it's not perfect. So the patients are seen by the nurses and the physical therapists. And they're triaged either into non-operative care. And if they're triaged into non-operative care, then they don't need to see a surgeon. They don't need to see a physician. And they're sent to the dietitian, weight loss, physical therapy, anti-inflammatories, et cetera. Or if they're triaged into surgical care, then they're referred to either the next available orthopedic surgeon based on their wait lists, or they're referred to an orthopedic surgeon of their choice. And if that surgeon has a longer wait list, then that patient understands up front that surgeon has a longer wait list and it's their choice. So nobody's being told where to go. They're being given a choice. So 
our group had a huge wait list. So our waiting time for consultation was 18 months. So we're not going to see any more patients if we don't do something about it. So that created internal competition within the system. Other groups within the city also wanted to see patients. And if they kept on saying our wait list is 18 months, or two years, or a year, or whatever, they're not going to see any patients. And those patients are going to go elsewhere. And they might even go outside the city. So that created a bit of an internal competition to help us streamline how we do things. And keep in mind that we like to complain about waiting lists and we like to blame it on others. We like to blame it on administrators and on the hospital. But at the end of the day, only you as an orthopedic surgeon can control how many patients you see in a day and how you spend your time in the office and how you can streamline how you see patients to be as efficient as possible. And at the same time, we created within that system a third model so uh, that involves uh, not only triaging and non-operative care, but also <coughs> preoperative optimization in terms of education for the patient. And the reason for that is instead of me spending a lot of time in my office talking to the patient about what to expect in the hospital and what the surgery is going to entail, so all I need to do is discuss the informed consent. And I'll say that Oasis will be contacting you between now and your surgical date. And they're going to spend 90 minutes with you and they're gonna discuss all these issues with you. So automatically that takes 15, 20 minutes away from my office time, and I can see two patients during those 15 or 20 minutes. So this Oasis Clinic became a virtual concept because the various groups in the city that do joint placement realize unless they start to work together, they're gonna to be cannibalized by this massive system that will hire less expensive personnel nurses and physiotherapists to screen and triage patients and ultimately refer them to, to surgeons, and then surgeons are going to lose control. So three competing groups were set up in the city, the complex joint clinic where I work, and there was a joint replacement uh, clinic in North Vancouver and a Richmond joint replacement program in Richmond. And the various surgeon groups worked together to different degrees. Our group were true partners. We pool our incomes. We divide our incomes equally so that way if I have a clinic, if I can't make that clinic, somebody else can do the clinic if I need to be in the OR. It's completely seamless. It doesn't really matter who does what. We've got one person who's in charge of assigning us. Today you're doing a follow-up clinic, today you're doing a new patient clinic and uh, he'll monitor the wait list and say, well, come on guys, we need to ramp it up a little bit and assigns people in the OR based on need. So if I have more patients waiting for surgery, he'll put me more in the operating room as opposed to the clinic and get somebody else with a shorter wait list in the clinic to build up their wait lists. So we were able to equalize wait lists that way by working together. And that concept, because of that competition, so we've introduced private care within a public system, has led to significant shortening of wait times for consultations. And instead of uh, patients waiting 18 months, now the longest wait list in our group is about four months and the shortest is about four weeks for a patient to be seen. And that happened very quickly, simply by saying, we're watching what we're doing, now we understand that we control what we're doing, and if we don't control it, somebody else will control it for us. So what has that, what has that done to, to our preoperative processes? What do we do? So the, the goal is to have a well-prepared patient who will have an extraordinary experience and a predictable outcome, and at the, in, at the end of the day, will be happy, will recommend their friends and families, and will not complain. But at the same time, we have a competing interest. We, we need to process them as quickly as possible, get them in as quickly as possible, and get them seen as quickly as possible without them feeling rushed. Because the last thing you want is a patient who's seen in 10 minutes, they're feeling rushed, and they start complaining. So you have to set up processes in place that they're looked after at multiple venues. So for their medical clearance, instead of me spending a lot of time clearing them, we contracted with an internist to come to our office and to see patients in our clinic instead of us referring to them. And then they do the medical clearance. So that way, we're, it's a double check that we're not missing any medical issues. And now we make the appointment. They come in, and they see him on a Friday. He does all the medical clearance instead of doing it in the hospital. And then the education is done through the OASIS clinic, so we don't have to spend time doing the education in the office. All we have to do is focus on the informed consent from an orthopedic point of view, discuss the risks, the benefits, etc. And the inpatient preparation is done by the OASIS clinic so that we're not wasting a whole lot of time in the pre-admission clinic. That way more patients can be seen in the pre-admission clinic. 
So in the office, we do a consultation, like as you all do, but we had to come up with a way to shorten that consultation time. We used to book 45 minutes for a new patient. 45 minutes for a new patient in an eight hour day translates to 12 patients or 14 patients. Well, that's not quite good enough if, if you wanna get patients seen quickly to reduce that 18 month wait list. We wanna identify medical issues quickly by, by not relying on memory and we need to be able to optimize patients. So what we do, we get patients to fill out a lot of forms. So they fill out uh, orthopedic questionnaires, they fill out medical questionnaires, and those medical questionnaires trigger as to what needs to happen later. And the orthopedic questionnaire can tell me at a glance whether they need surgery or not. So that information is entered in the computer ahead of time before I see the patient. I walk into the room, I've got two screens, there are x-rays on one screen, there are questionnaires, orthopedic questionnaires, medical questionnaires on, on the other screen. Their medications are entered and checked ahead of time, their allergies are entered and checked ahead of time. So basically, I, I, all I have to do is confirm that the information is accurate. And we watch for certain things like diabetes, pacemakers, high BMI, et cetera, to, to optimize the patients. Even things like if they have a penicillin allergy, the computer will automatically order prophylactic antibiotics with clindamycin as opposed to penicillin so that you, or cefazolin so that you, you avoid errors. And the information in the medical questionnaire will automatically get dumped into the booking form. That way there's no errors in providing booking forms. And it will also generate an automatic consultation letter. That way as the patient is leaving the room after they, they're 10 minutes with us, they will have a consultation letter in their hand that they can keep for their files and their family physician or referring doctor will get that letter that same day. Also by having all the information up front, the booking package can be sent to the hospital right away. We're not spending time the next day trying to collate the information. Our assistant in the office isn't spending time and that reduces overhead, which is very important because our fees are a little lower than the fees here, but our overheads are a lot lower. So you, you, you wanna maintain a really low overhead because otherwise that's money out of your pocket. So the medical clearance starts at the point of decision making. So the, before the patient comes in, we know right away that patient has diabetes, we need to make sure their hemoglobin A1C is under 7%. As opposed to me asking Mrs. Smith, so tell me, do you have any medical problems? Well, you know, six months ago I had this, and you know, we're avoiding all that repetitive information and the repetitive bad historian stuff, because they have all the time in the world to discuss it with their family members, to help them fill out the forms, and then we're firm to, not necessarily this guy, because I didn't have Dr. Chandler's photograph, but he looks kind of like them, who will see them again to make sure that they're optimized for the patients that we've identified that a problem. So he identifies any risks that they have, he quotes them a perioperative risk, and then he optimizes them for surgery. And then that way when they're sent to the pre-admission clinic, they've already been worked up. And that way we can reduce post-op complications and hopefully reduce the length of stay uh, because of the avoidance of post-operative complications. And if we can reduce the length of stay, we can do more cases because now we don't have bed pressures. We try to minimize blood transfusions by uh, having a blood conservation strategy. Uh, basically, if their hemoglobin is less than 12 and a half or their ferritin is less, less than 60, they go to this uh, blood utilization program run by a hematologist, an anesthesiologist, and a nurse. And it doesn't matter where they live, they're treated ahead of time. If they need EPO, they're given EPO. If they need IV iron infusions, they, give, they get IV iron inf infusions. We do not pre-donate autologous blood because we found that it doesn't actually work. And we use tranexamic acid for almost every patient intraoperative to, to minimize uh, the risk of transfusion. And we know that if you're gonna transfuse a patient, you're gonna increase the length of, uh, length of stay by a day. If you increase the length of stay by a day, that bed is not available and then you might potentially get a cancellation. So the last thing we wanna do is staff an OR and then cancel because there's no bed. So we've done our surgical decision, we've done the medical clearance, and typically the medical clearance happens over here. We've shifted it over to the left a little bit because that way that gives us a lot of time for the pre-admission clinic, for the patients to be seen in the pre-admission clinic and to have their education. And then that way when they come in the day of surgery, they're very well prepared. And ideally, because we've done all that work up front, we avoid these cancellations when they're seen in the pre-admission clinic. And that used to be a big problem. You get a phone call the day before, two days before, oh, Mrs. Smith needs an echo. You're gonna have to cancel her. 
well, okay, I'll book somebody else. But we don't have a slot in the pre-admission clinic. He can't book anybody else because he can't be seen. So that's a waste of time. <coughs> and because the patients are well-educated through this OASIS pre-op education, you minimize the number of emails and the number of questions that you get pre-op because that all takes time. It takes my assistant's time. It takes my time. So you want to avoid all that stuff because we're all busy and we don't really want to wait, be wasting too much time. All patients are given a, an education booklet in the office that they're supposed to read. There's a bunch of websites they can look at. And their attendance at the pre-op teaching is mandatory as long as they can attend. If they live out of town, and British Columbia is a massive place, if they live uh, way out of town, then they can do it online, or they can do it at another, if they live closer to Kelowna, some reasonable sized city, then they can go to their pre-op education program in Kelowna. It's all pretty similar, so it's, it's stream streamlined across the province. And it takes about 90 minutes, and the booklet that they're given is translated so it's available in English, in Punjabi, and in Mandarin because of our patient populations. We haven't really translated to other languages, but those are the big ones that we see. So patient expectations are established up front. They know exactly what to expect, exactly when they're going to go home. And they know that uh, we, we have a lot of entitled patients. They want to be in the hospital forever. So they know two to three days and you're out. Uh, if there's a reason why they need to stay longer, so we know about it ahead of time, the case management leader starts working on discharge planning early and on getting them to rehab if necessary. And they cover all these things that you all cover. Uh, hip precautions, uh, prophylaxis for DVT, etc. So we really want to promote efficiency while delivering care in delivering surgical services. So we want to do the most, we want to spend the least, while at the same time maintaining quality. And keep in mind that if there is no timely access, there is no quality. You can have all the excellent outcomes you like, but if you're not providing the service, the patient does not perceive it as quality. And our traditional model with working with our administrator, uh, administrators has been us and them, and now we would fight. It's always us against them. We would never, ever collaborate because they're the enemy. They're the ones who are not providing us with, with money to do our work, and nothing ever got done. So what we decided is that we're going to be the providers of care, and the administrators are going to be the facilitators of care, and that we're going to work together to achieve our goals of timely access and excellent quality. And for us to, to have a system that works, you have to have a committed physician who's going to work as an administrator, and you have to have a committed ad administrator who's going to work with the physician. So we have a co-management model. So I work with, uh, with, two peri with a perioperative director and a surgical director, one for the ward side, one for the OR, work with them hand, hand in hand, each unit has an administrator and a physician working together. And the system has to be dynamic to get the work done. You have to be able to change how you do things. It has to be responsive. And as the situation changes, you, you have to change tax. And it has to be collaborative. We have to understand what the fiscal reality is. So we can't be asking for the moon if we're trying to get our work done. We have to have uh, an honest dialogue. It has to be transparent, and it has to be data-driven. Now, we see a lot of competing interests. Every service tells us we need more OR time for liver surgery. We need more OR time for general surgery. So we look at the data, and we say, OK, so what, are, what, what is the true demand? What is the true need? And now we base it, we, ha we are trying to convince our surgeons that the OR resources <coughs> are not for the surgeon. They're for the patient. The patient owns the OR resources, and the patient owns the ward resources. We're simply custodians, and we provide the service. So if uh, you expect to get two OR days a week, and you don't really have enough patients, and you're stretching your time, we're going to take it away from you and give it to somebody else. This is not punishment. This is just because the patients don't need it. And now we give it to the patients who need it. And that's one way of reallocating resources without hurting physicians but by allowing patients to be treated. And the ultimate test is that when we work this way, government was responsive and they gave us the extra money to deliver the cases. So how do we work together as a group? So we have a contract with the hospital to do a minimum number of cases. So our contract says, 
you're expected to do, at one hospital, we are expected to do 890 cases at Vancouver General Hospital and a minimum 1,100 cases at UBC Hospital for the four orthopedic surgeons. If we don't perform those cases, they will take the fee-for-service price per case and they will subtract it for each case that we don't do. And if we overperform within the allotted number of OR days that we have, if we can do more cases, then they will pay us that extra. So automatically, we're motivated to get the work done. So we didn't quite believe them when we first started that they will, that they will take money away because that has never happened. And it has never happened with any other service. They, they pay and whatever you get, whatever you get. So the first year, they came to me and said, you guys underperformed by $80,000 worth. So I turned to our guys and said, sorry guys, there's no paycheck this week because I gotta pay the money back to the hospital. So the next year, we met our targets. The year after, we exceeded our targets. So we exceeded by 250 cases. So 250 cases is a fair bit of money for each surgeon. And that was done without increasing OR allocation. So how, how did we do that? So before we ask for more, we have to ask ourselves, have we done the most with what we have? Have we maximized our bed utilization by minimizing length of stay? Have we improved our OR utilization? And have we improved our prosthetic cost? So we all had to work as a team with a common vision, and our vision was we gotta compete with these other surgeons, we gotta have as short a waiting time as possible so that we can attract patients to maintain our orthoplasty practices because we don't wanna start doing front and ankle, we don't wanna start doing shoulder surgery, and certainly we don't wanna start taking trauma call. And so we have to have a shared goal. Our goal was you got to do a minimum number of cases. Otherwise, the bottom line, your income is going to go down. And we all have to have the same values to achieve those goals. And those values are you work as hard as possible, you don't waste time, and you do what you're told by your leader. And the leader is not me. The leader is the division head. I'm the department chairman, but we have a division head, and I report to him when it comes to doing that work. And this ship only has one captain. We don't have two captains. We can't have, I don't like this, I don't like that. You don't like it, there's the door. There's another hospital you can work. So what about beds? Prior to 1995, so before I started practice, we were doing 600 cases in 48 beds. And the length of stay was over 14 days. Now, by about 2002, great success. Length of stay was six to 11 days. Fantastic. So now we have 26 beds instead of 48 because as you get squeezed, as the cost pressures go up, well, you don't have 48 beds anymore. You only have 26. We went down from 2,000 beds in our hospital to 700 beds. And our volume at that site went up to 1,100 cases, so 890 joint placements plus 120 oncology cases instead of 600 in 26 instead of 48 beds. So right off the bat, you can see, we had to reduce our length of stay to two to four days, depending on the acuity. So we did what you all do, clinical pathways. But we added variance tracking to monitor who is falling off the pathway and why, and uh, had a continued quality assurance program. So the pathway was first introduced in 1997. And then our goal was to reduce the length of stay five to five to seven days. So automatically, as soon as you set a target of five to seven days, no patient's gonna leave the hospital before five days because that's your target. So we watched it and patients were staying up to five days and that was great. But then we saw that anemia was a predictor of a higher length of stay and nausea was a predictor of a higher length of stay. So we introduced this blood utilization program and multimodal analgesia, which you all do here. And we started noticing that patients are getting ready to be discharged before the five days, but the physical therapists weren't getting them ready for discharge because the pathway said that they cannot be discharged before five days. <coughs> so we changed the pathway where patients can be discharged at one day, two days, three days, four days. So it's the same pathway for every day of their length of stay. As soon as they achieve their targets, if you achieve your targets for discharge by one day, you can be discharged at one day. If you achieve it two days, you can be discharged in two days. So when we started the CSI model, 50% uh, of patients are being discharged in two days now. And that's related to more rapid mobilization. It was taboo to get the patient out of bed the same day. So now, unless they're done late in the day, we get them out of bed the same day. 
Uh, physical therapy staffing is now seven days a week to avoid the problem with longer length of stay at the, at the end of the week, but that's still a bit of a problem. We arrange home physical therapy if needed if patients can't leave the house and preemptive multimodal analgesia. And then before I talk about what you really want to hear about is uh, how we improved efficiency in the OR, we tried to squeeze the vendors for lower prices for prosthetics. So we had provincial contracts as opposed to hospital-based contracts. We insisted that if you're going to work at our hospital, you're going to, all the surgeons have to standardize. So you can't have your own prosthesis. Not every surgeon can have their own prosthesis. You can't have a different implant system every day of the week because the nurses can't really learn a different implant system. We wanted to minimize inventory, and it has to be evidence-based. So we can't have somebody doing ceramic on ceramic on every patient or in, in the metal on metal days, metal on metal for every patient. And also we have policies that don't allow the rep in the OR to say, oh, why don't you try this, the ceramic head? That really works well. Or, and don't you think that this young patient needs ceramic on ceramic? I've got the ceramic liner for you. So you can't do that because if that happens, you've got to fill out a form and justify why you did it. And those forms are tracked and then they come to me says, look, this surgeon, is his rate of ceramic on ceramic is 25% and the expected dorm is 5%. What's going on? So that surgeon will be talked to, say justify it. And we also have policies that uh, if it's an unproven technology, and as far as I'm concerned, ceramic on ceramic, at 10 year data, it is unproven, the patient has to pay the difference in price. It's okay if the patient wants it, you write a check for $2,200 and you can get whatever you want. So now we have three vendors uh, across the region for one and a quarter million patients. And the only time we allow two different implant systems in a hospital is if there's a financial benefit. So at one site, we have a very high volume. And then one company came in at a little bit lower price than another company. And both companies were awarded a contract. So to squeeze the other company, we allowed a second vendor in. And then they lowered their price by $300 per case. So by having two vendors, and then the, the rules are 50% of the hips go to Depew, 50% go to Zimmer. They allowed both vendors to drop their prices to, now we're paying now $1,800 for a hip replacement and $1,600 for a knee replacement, all in. And all surgeons have to agree to the standardized approach. And we saved, uh, out of a $30 million spend, $2.3 million from 2011 moving forward. So that, that was very significant. Any new technology and I get in trouble with my colleagues, I want evidence. Show me good evidence, otherwise you're not getting that new technology. Uh, it has to be used wisely and we have to understand that it's not always better. And we learn from the metal on metal experience. We did thousands of metal on metal joint replacements or hip replacements and now we're revising a lot of them. And we have to use registries. The uh, American Joint Replacement Registry has been up and running for quite a while now and, and it can be the largest registry in the world. And can possibly provide the most useful information if it is complete. And the problem with registries, unless you have 100% or 99% compliance, uh, it won't work. And Bruce will know in New Zealand, there is 98% compliance. It's completely voluntary. In Canada, we have the Canadian Joint Placement Registry, and our compliance is dismal. It's 60%, so it's completely useless. So I've been working for about seven years with the Ministry of Health in BC to make it mandatory. We finally, in 2012, made it mandatory in British Columbia and in Ontario. So we have taken registering patients out of the hands of the surgeons because it didn't matter what we did, we could not incentivize the surgeons to enter patients in the registry, and now the hospital enters those patients in the registry. So in five years, we can look at outlier implants, we can, we can know very quickly, this implant isn't working, it's eliminated. It will not be used in British Columbia. It'll be taken off the shelves. So what about uh, differences in opinions in the group? So if you've got four surgeons that have differences in opinions, it's by a majority vote if consensus is not possible. Uh, dissenting surgeons have to agree once a decision's been made, they have to agree. They can't say, I don't like it, I don't want it. You don't like it, you don't want it, you leave. And this is what you have to do to work at our hospital. If you don't like it, either convince us or leave, but it can't be because you have a contract with this company and you have a conflict of interest and that's why you want to bring in that product. So we have regular reviews of our performance. Uh, we carefully look at our M&M documentation and then we look at NISQIP data to make sure that we're doing a good job. 
So our time is allocated not based on silos and favoritism, not because you're the chairman of the department, you're gonna get more OR time than the other guy. It's uh, a patient resource, not a surgeon resource. And we look at uh, audited and, and, and cleaned up wait lists. And a very common thing to do is to see a lot of patients and to book them prophylactically. So you see somebody who has a little bit of mild OA, and you know, Mrs. Smith, my waiting list is two years. You don't really need it now, but I'm gonna book you because by the time you need it, you'll be ready. So you have these completely artificial and padded wait lists. And what reality is, is that Mrs. Smith will come in in two years and say, well, you know, I'm still not that bad. So I don't wanna have it done. So Mrs. Smith doesn't get done. So she's on the wait list for even longer. And then when you look at, uh, at queuing theory, so when you go to Starbucks, and there are a lot of Starbucks here, you, there's two lines. The first line you pay and you order your latte or whatever. Then you go and you pick up your latte from the, from the far side of the counter. Just imagine if you stood in line and it was a perfect line, you paid on time, and everybody was treated first come, first serve. But the guy who's making the latte took those cups on the side and started to shuffle the order. What would happen to the people when they pick up their coffees and their lattes? You're gonna get a guy who's gonna get it right away, and you're gonna get a guy who's gonna wait two hours to get their latte. Very quickly, that Starbucks is gonna get shut down. And this is exactly what happens with wait lists. You book the surgery, and then you get them done in a random order. The patient who cries out the most gets done first, or your friend gets done first. So in, in queuing theory, you can look at the, how long any individual has been on a wait list and what proportion of the patients are under a certain target. And then you can look once they've been done, once their surgery's been done, what proportion have been done within less than that target. And you do those ratios. In a perfectly orderly system, that ratio should be two to one. If that ratio is under one, so in other words, you've got patients on the wait list for a lot longer than patients are being served, then you know that patients aren't being done, or they're being done in a completely random order. Now we have that data, and now we share that data with all the surgeons, not only orthopedic surgeons, but all the surgeons, all the services. Now we give the services a letter grade from A plus to F, based on their performance. And if they have a low performance, we tell them we're taking OR time away from you because obviously you're applying random principles to allocating resources for patients and you don't really need as much OR time. So very quickly people start to change their behavior because it's gonna impact them. And then when they start to compete with each other, oh, oh my God, neurosurgery has an F, but orthopedics has an A, so orthopedics has to get better OR, better OR access. So that has made people more accountable for utilization of OR time. And if you don't use your OR time, we take it away from you and that requires coordination within a group. So if, you, if you're a well-functioning group, you coordinate your vacation time, your academic absences, your clinic time, so that no time goes unused. Now we standardize equipment. We use lean principles. I had to learn about lean methodology. I had to learn from Toyota, how they do things, and do the gambas, and, and then you work together, and then you take out the waste, and anything that doesn't add value, you get rid of it. So even in the OR, and totally sets are eight pans. You look at those pans, half the instruments we never use. Get rid of them because it's everything for everybody. So IM guides, we don't use them, we use EM guides. Get rid of them. So we streamlined the pans to four pans. So it's less time for the nurses to set up, less time to dismantle, less time in SPD, save money. So the day of surgery, the patient arrives. Uh, everything has to be done up front. All anesthetics are standard. Every patient gets a spinal anesthetic, no epidurals. We don't do blocks in the OR. If a patient needs a block, we don't have block bays at the hospital because it's an older OR. They do the blocks in PAR because it's a spinal anesthetic. They send somebody else to do the femoral nerve block in PAR while the spinal anesthetic is still in place. So that saves time in the operating room. We ran into a problem with us being more efficient in the OR, but the holding room where the patients are brought in can't keep up. So what they do, they look at the slate and say, okay, you're booked to start your next case at two o'clock. That patient will not be ready until two o'clock, but I'm ready for that patient at one. No, 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 no. We've got more important patients to deal with because the other room needs, we need to make her. Right. So I said, fine. We changed the, t 
times on the OR slate to make it look like we're going to be behind. So my OR slate, and this is a game that we play, I'm supposed to finish at 3.30, when I know I'm going to finish at 5. So they always think I'm behind, and they hustle to process the patient. That way we're not waiting for the patient to come in. Just little things that you have to do. So you have to understand the culture of the hospital. And we tried as much as we could to tell them, look, let's all work together. It didn't work. We have to make sure that the limbs are signed. So we have, for each room, we have one person assigned, not random. Your job is to do this. If you don't do it, you're a cannibal. And it's usually the resident of the fellow. I talked about the anesthetics. And I talked about minimizing clutter in the OR, having as uh, few instruments as possible. Now we, have a, we need to have a constant review of instruments. So if you, if you have unutilized stuff, get rid of it. Uh, and the surgeon must not be a barrier to standardization. So we all have the same pick lists. We all do things exactly the same way. And then we all learn from each other what works the best. We just do it. So what is the impact? So this is what we used to do. In a typical OR schedule, and this is from my EMR, from uh, 2000, January 10, 2006, before we started this initiative. This is a typical day, three cases. So we first started out by having a more thoughtful way of booking. So we used to, to have to book the revisions first because the hospital really wanted us to do the complicated cases first just in case we go over so they can cancel the last case. So the motivation is you gotta finish on time or we gotta be able to cancel you. But if you do the most complex case first, you might have equipment issues, you might have requested some special equipment that's not there. So that's gonna delay the start of the day while you get everything ready. And that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy and you're gonna cancel your last case of the day. So we switched it around. You do the simplest case first, that gives you more time in the day to start to plan for the rest of the day to make sure that what you've asked for is, is actually there. <coughs> And it allows the, the whole team to, ad, to adjust their speed so that you don't finish late. So with inefficiency, we expected to do three to four cases per day. And we used to sit in the lounge or go do paperwork or spend time on the ward for hours on end. And room efficiency was not a priority. And this is why seeing patients in the office wasn't a priority. Because if I can't operate on them, what's the point in seeing them? And this is from my EMR. From 2005, I was seeing 21 consults per day. And that generated an 18-month wait list. So this is a sample room schedule. So case one, you start the, bring the patient to the pre-op room at 10 after 7, patient in PACU at 10 after 9. Case number four, you finish at 3.10 or so. And if you're going to do a fifth case, you're going to finish at 10 after 5. However, the block ends at 4.30. So what you do, you start dragging your heels to finish between 4 and 4.30, and that way the staff don't have to leave our room and go to the general surgery room. So it became the standard that you only do four cases in a day. And if you have a slow team, your last case got canceled. Also, turnover is a necessary evil. Uh, we estimate that we sit idle at least 50% of the day. We're not operating 50% of the day. So we thought when we started this new system, how are we going to do 1,600 cases in a, in a year when we only have four surgeons plus a smattering of a few low-volume surgeons? So we had to do eight to 10 cases per day. So with coordination, you can run two rooms and do eight to 10 cases per day. So the first time I, I tried this, I tried this concept in 2005 to see if I can get buy-in. And it was an uphill battle trying to convince anesthesiologists and nurses that it's safe for a surgeon to operate in two rooms. And these are, these are not two parallel rooms, but they would be two staggered rooms. I was allowed to do six cases, and this is in 2005. And it was uh, the first time I did this was the most stressful day in my life in the OR because I was being watched by everybody. And they were ready to cancel. They had a hair trigger to cancel your last case or last two cases. So we introduced a swing room model, which is not the double room model that I learned when I was a fellow. So when I was a fellow at, at HSS, we'd run two rooms. So Tom Skolko would be in one room, I'd be in the other room. And then we'd be operating together. And hey, Tom, I've got a problem. And he'll zip over and take a look. And if there's no problem, that's fine. But that's not really providing the same quality of care for every patient. Because a patient in Tom's room got better care than the patient in my room. So we wanted to make sure 
that the surgeon was there for the entire case, even though the surgeon is operating in two rooms. So how do we do that? So we staggered the start times in both rooms. And there are a lot of advantages to staggering the, the start times. If you have an airport with all the planes taking off at the same time, you're going to have chaos. So no, no airport operates like that. So you, you stagger them a little bit. That way, you have, if you stagger the operating rooms, you have better break management for the nurses. If you don't have as many nurses in the room, you can take one nurse from one room to go help out in the other room when it's mo most acute. You can streamline the instrument return to SPD, so they're, not all the instruments are coming at, at the same time. You're not bringing two patients from the holding room at the same time. The cleaners, you're not competing for cleaners for the two rooms, because the rooms need to be cleaned at different times. And we don't have to rely on a resident or a fellow, because I can get a PGY-3, or I can have a PGY-5, I can have a foreign trained fellow, or I can have a superstar. And I can't predict from one day to the other who I'm going to have. So my system has to be consistent no matter who I have in the room. And the goal was to complete eight joint placements per day, beginning at eight and finishing at five. They wanted us to copy a system that was being done in Richmond, and I absolutely resisted. So the system in Richmond was very simple. Two surgeons, two rooms. And then the surgeon from one room, they stagger them, goes and helps the surgeon in the other room. Then the surgeon from this room goes and helps the surgeon in the other room. Plus, they had another assistant. And the rationale for that was that the surgeon would bill for the surgical fee plus the assist fee, so they increase their incomes. And that's, that was the rationale for that system. Well, my system is better. The surgeon's going to bill for the surgical fee in this room and the surgical fee in that room, which is higher than the assist fee. Plus, that second surgeon is going to be in the office seeing patients and reducing that weight one, as opposed to having two surgeons in the operating room. So what I really wanted to do is eliminate having two surgeons in the operating room at the same time. And here's a sample schedule. If we look at how long it takes us to do a case, our average room time is now 90 minutes. Over there, it used to be two hours. So there's lots of time to spare before 5 o'clock <coughs> if you're doing eight cases. So the assumptions, what the, the surgeon, everybody arrives on time, we start on time. That's a, that's a given. And you'd be surprised how difficult it is to actually start the room on time. The patients have to be ready on time. And we staff the first room from 7.30 to 4.30, the second room from 8 to 5. We have to have better planning to avoid complications. Obviously, we have to select our patients appropriately. We cannot have any equipment issues, so we have a minimum of eight total knee sets in the hospital and a minimum of eight total hip sets in the hospital. We have a staggering number of implants, plus we have a shuttle that goes back and forth between two sites. So if we run out of implants, we have a rep in the room, gets an implant on a shuttle, that implant is in in 25 minutes. So you try to anticipate it ahead of time. And there should be no unnecessary surgical delays and uh, no anesthetic delays. So we have achieved most of these goals, and it seems to work. So this is a typical day before. First room, total hip, total knee, scope, scope, total knee, scope, 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 scope. That's how it used to work. So what we did, we said, okay, these, these blocks are all total joints. So patient in the room, a few minutes later, skin incision. This is when the surgeon used to leave, or some of the surgeons still leave before closure is finished, and then the patient's out of the room. What I've also tried to do now is to squeeze that time a little more, because I've done some, some uh, time management, and it takes about 22 minutes for the resident or the fellow to close a total joint, but it takes eight minutes for me and a resident or a fellow to close a total joint. So 22 minus eight is 14 minutes, so those 14 minutes, you take them here, 14 times five, it's just about enough time to do an extra joint. And that's exactly what we do now. So by shaving some of that time, you reduce that time, and you put a little bit of squeeze on the other room to start moving the cleaning and the setup faster, and now I can do 10 joints instead of eight joints in a day. Simple little things. And this is what it looks like. So it, to, to work in the system, we wanted each surgeon to increase their efficiency by a minimum of 15% within the first year. They had to utilize 90% of their block time, otherwise they wouldn't get OR time. And 
if they're not academic surgeons, they have to train their first assist to help them close, to move faster, and they can't compromise patient safety. So there are certain factors for this system to work. The cases that take longer ha can't be booked first, they have to be booked last, because it, it will interfere with the flow. We have three nurses per room, and that way, if somebody calls in sick, we can still operate. We can do bilateral cases, and they're done at the last case of the day. Some surgeons do bilateral hips as first case of the day. So what they would do, they'd do the first side, and as the resident of the fellow is closing, they go to the next room, they do another case, and then they come back and do the other side. But if you're a bit faster, that will in actually interfere with the, speed, with, with the flow of the rooms because it's faster to do both sides at the end of the day, and that's what I do now. So even for bilateral hips, I would do them, close them, flip them, do them, and then you're done. No x-rays in the room, all x-rays in PACU. Uh, no, I don't do x-rays for knees anymore because it doesn't add value, we do the x-rays later. So when you first started the system, I wanted to make sure that everybody's on board. So we had a monitoring sheet that monitored absolutely everything. So we monitored when the patient got into the room, when the positioning started, when, when the anesthetic started, when the anesthetic finished, when the positioning started, when the skin incision was made, when the closure started, when the closure was finished, when the patient was out of the room, when the cleaners came in, when the cleaners were out of the room, when the setup started. And we kept that monitoring sheet and then we had targets. And if those targets were not met, <coughs> people who were responsible for those targets were held accountable. And after about a year, we stopped, it became routine, and we didn't have to monitor it anymore. So now with this system, we do eight to 10 cases per day, and allows the patient to be in the office seeing more patients. So here's the impact in 2011, 10 joints by 5 p.m. And what about the impact on clinics? I showed you this in 2005, 21 patients per day. And here's the billing, $2,500, and now, 44 patients in a day, billings $4,300 per day. So that obviously improves your efficiency, sees more patients, get more patients served, and improves the bottom line. What about surgery uh, or follow-up clinics? In 2005, 38 patients, $1,800. And now we see 84 patients, whoops, almost $6,000. So that also improves efficiency and improves throughput. And now that we're so efficient, we went from 1,600 cases per year with two rooms five days a week. Last year, we did 1,930 cases in the same amount of time. So the hospital came to us and said, you know, you're, you're so efficient, you're catching up on your wait list, so let's reduce the number of cases to back to 1,600. So we shifted some surgeons out. We were giving some time to surgeons from other cities to catch up on the wait lists, and we're not getting paid for those case, cases from their health authorities anymore. So I said, you know what? We've been teaching how to do this for six years. Now you can go do it at your own place. And we eliminated Thursdays, and the reason for that is as you eliminate Thursday, you improve the flow during the week. Because there have been studies that showed that length of stay is determined by what day of the week you operate. We have consistent OR teams. Uh, they're very motivated. They take pride in what they do. They take pride in being efficient. And if we have shown the hospital this works for joint placement, and we can make it work for other areas. But you'd be surprised how much resistance I've had for other services to do the same thing. And they all have excuses. It doesn't work. It's not a streamlined joint placement. Things are dif different. But in any process in life, 80% is routine. Think about anything you do. 80% is routine, 20% is non-routine. So if you can eliminate that 20%, and granted that, so revisions are different. We don't do revisions in the setting. That's non-routine. <coughs> Focus on the routine, you can improve what you do. So how do I get engagement from the staff? We have uh, staff lunches, we have dinners out, and uh, we host the annual Christmas party for the, for the entire hospital at our house. And that's been a great success. We have 150 nurses and allied staff uh, for the Christmas party, and that keeps them engaged. And that, that, that allows you to get to, to know the staff on a personal level. We've engaged the recovery room staff as well. The pathways start in the recovery room. They're included in the Christmas parties and the celebrations and so on to uh, keep them engaged. So there are lots of potential, uh, other potential applications. Uh, you need to apply lean methodology. We need to reject the past when appropriate. We need to focus and improve uh, things that we can. We need to eliminate waste, eliminate duplication, eliminate excuses. And that's the most common thing that we hear. There's always excuses and we need to incentivize our staff. And nothing is sacred. 
but we're told we work at a teaching hospital. This is the most common excuse I hear. I hear it from the cardiac surgeons all the time. We are a teaching hospital. We teach. So do I. Residents take longer to operate. They're more inefficient. They need more resources. But where's the evidence? In fact, there is no evidence. This is perception. This is expect it's all about expectations. And this is education folklore. Residents will work at the pace that you tell them to work at. You set the pace. And if you teach the residents that it's OK to be inefficient, it's OK to take twice as long, they will get into practice, and they will take twice as long. I've been training residents for a long time. And I see them when they finish. I see them when they're residents. So I tell them for a total knee, because we, we use a tourniquet, and you can argue whether you should use a tourniquet or not. And the main thing about tourniquets is it's got a timer on it. So you've got 30 minutes or less, or I'm going to take the knife away from you. So, you know, I, at 32 minutes, I don't take the knife away. At 35 minutes, I don't take. But that sets the expectation right off the bat. And everything has to be done the same way every single time. So for a total knee, they're given a video to study ahead of time, and they see exactly how I do it. And I show them for the first slate how it's done. And moving forward, every step has to be done the same way every single time. There's no deviation. There's no Dr. Jones does it that way. There's no Dr. Duncan does it that way. I don't care. You're working with me. You do it my way. And if you can't keep track of how we do it, write it down in a book, review the book before you come to the OR. And we also use a trained assistant. And that assistant, my wife is a physician. She's my first assist. She knows how to do it totally better than any resident or fellow. So she's holding the retractors, and the resident or the fellow is operating, and I'm there coaching. I'm there standing next to them. That way I can intervene when I have to. And I'm not holding retractors when they're operating. That becomes very inefficient, because uh, I can't teach when I'm holding retractors. So I, I get somebody to hold the retractors, and they do it. Clive Duncan, one of my partners, gets his daughter to assist them. She's also a physician, and she's his first assist. And he also is teaching. And that's how you, you not only improve the teaching, but you also improve the efficiency. Now, we had to learn from Jack Welsh, who said, control your destiny, or somebody else will. I'd like to thank you again for this very kind invitation. I look forward to uh, a discussion. So thank you so much. Outstanding. Thanks You're a visionary. Much. Can we turn on the lights here? Aaron, can you help us with it? So um, questions. Outside of uh, having your family members as first assists, I think there are a lot of great ideas for us. Any thoughts? So um, do talk to us again about risk stratification in terms of the high complexity patients um, and how to more or less try to have a system that has a lot of bread and butter. And I apologize for people having to leave. We have uh, a lot of oral obligations. Oh, that's okay. um, but we'll have a little uh, gathering outside afterwards. Uh, so we have until about 8 o'clock in this room. Um, time management here also. Uh, how do you kind of account for the high variability of patients as you're tracking outcomes and complications, for instance? So what we do, uh, so we, are, we operate at two hospitals, Vancouver General Hospital and UBC Hospital. So at UBC Hospital, when we first started the system, we had criteria. So they were very, very strict. It had to be ASA 1 or 2, BMI less than 35, narcotic intake less than 60 milligrams of morphine per day, no OSA. So they had to be very, very straightforward cases. What we found shortly thereafter, well, I, I always resisted those really tight criteria, but anesthesia insisted that we have really strict criteria. So we, inc we increased the criteria to if they're ASA 3, as long as they're seen by an internist and optimized ahead of time, they're okay. If the ASA 3 is not related to aortic stenosis, congestive heart failure, or severe COPD. We set up a, a high acuity unit, it's called the surgical observation unit, for anybody with sleep apnea, so they're monitored overnight. Anybody who's uh, ASA 3, we increased the narcotic, uh, the pre-op narcotic intake to 120 milligrams of morphine from 60. And age used to be, had to be under 80. Now it's okay if you're over 80, if you've been screened by an internist and you're deemed to be appropriate. So the internal medicine workup, if they're deemed appropriate, they're done at that hospital. If not, they're done at a different hospital where there are more resources, it's higher acuity. Now we're, we're, we're working now at moving all patients to UBC, so we have to set up a more robust high acuity unit that's uh, supervised by intensivists to make sure that uh, the sicker patients can be done over there. But to have a really streamlined system, you take the 80% routine, you do them in the system, and then you keep the more complex cases in the single room where you also do the revisions, and that's how you deal with the 20% outliers. 
In terms of tracking outcomes, uh, we use the Nisquip risk uh, stratified data. So uh, I don't know, do you participate with Nisquip here? I don't know whether we're on that on our joint side, but uh, in Spine we have our own system here, statewide registry now. Okay, so we, we, we participate in Nisquip, and uh, we get our data collected, and then we're always in the top decile. We collect our infection rates, we collect our dislocation rates, and we know our, our infection rate, for example, is 0.4%. Uh, Amazing, great. So it's not bad. So how did you deal with the expansion of follow-ups that became a problem in our system after government initiated massive increase in joint replacement surgery? So the follow-up, so that's why you see the follow-up clinics are now up to 84 patients per clinic. And so we see patients, uh, knee replacements, I see them at four weeks, and hip replacements, I see them at eight weeks. Their staples are removed by their family physician. If they have a problem, they come and see us, obviously. But for the most part, a lot of it is done by telemedicine. They can send me a picture with an iPhone and email it, and I can take a look at it and reassure them. If they need to come, they come. So we see them at that time, and the vast majority don't need to be seen again until the one-year mark. If they're, we're worried about them, we'll see them at three months. But the vast majority get seen at one year. Then we tell them come back at five years, and then at 10 years after that. At least 60 or 70% don't come back. Now there's some evidence that you actually don't need like the annual follow-up we talk about or long-term follow-up is not really necessary because you're not really picking a whole lot of stuff on routine follow-up except where you've identified a problem with implants. So if you have a metal and metal implant, we do more robust follow-up. When we were doing a lot of PFC modular knees with the uh, gamma and air sterilized poly, those need a lot of routine follow-up. But for the most part, annual or more regular follow-up is not really that necessary. So, uh, it's a comment and a question. Uh, a lot of it seems to be shaping patient expectations. You know, for example, here, it may be the same in Canada. Most of our, many of our patients pay a lot of money to come in and see us. And there are often angry family practitioners, primary care providers, angry patients. When somebody comes in after their primary care doctor says, you probably need a total knee. Then they see a mid-level provider who says, yes, I agree, I'm going to send you along to the total joint surgeon now. So, you know, that causes uh, sometimes some pretty vigorous complaints. And, and the other side of that is that uh, I'm sure all the joint surgeons here will say, we spent an inordinate amount of time with someone who says, I was on the internet, I want a direct interior, I want metal on metal, I want this approach. And I know you, last night you told us, all of your surgeons use the same approaches for all of their total joints. So it's sort of shaping the surgeons, but, but also shaping the patients up front. And is it, is it a little easier for you to do that, or is it the same problems that we have? No, they, 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 they do come in. They come in and say, I want to have a direct anterior approach, and we spend time. So because I don't spend too much time taking a history, I can spend a lot more time talking to the patient. So we tell them, look, there, there is no evidence that it's better. Show me the evidence that it's better after six weeks. Show me a randomized control trial that has truly shown that it's better, and I can show them the randomized control trials that we've done with the minimally invasive approaches that have shown no difference. And the vast majority, we can talk them out of it. And if they want to go see Dana Mears, knock yourself out. And these mm -hmm. patients, they're not upset that they are being funneled into a system where they're seeing a mid-level provider first automatically, and then having to see you no, they don't. So they, they can, they, they have a choice. So they either go to the Oasis Clinic or they come to see us directly. So we're competing with the Oasis Clinic. If we get our wait time to be less than the Oasis Clinic wait time, they'll come to see us directly. So they, they have complete choice. And uh, our patients don't pay. So there's zero payment. If they see us, I do work at a private clinic where they pay, they pay, a lot, they, they pay $750 for a consultation. That's I mean, probably a lot higher than here. But that's their choice. They have chosen to go there because they want to spend more time or they want to be seen after hours or whatever. And I, I only see them after hours because I'm too busy during the day. It seems like there's an initial investment of resource and effort on the front end to make this all happen. Uh, in this cost cutting era, the healthcare, particularly our institution, our state institution, how do you convince leadership to give that initial first investment, like a nurse practitioner on the floor to reduce length of stay numbers, a medical doctor on, on the side? That, uh, and see the 
So for the nurse practitioner, uh, the way we convinced them, we had a choice between nurse practitioner or hospitalist on the ward. Because we told them at the end of the day, if you want us to do the work, we can only be stretched so far. And it's cheaper for me to be operating and then giving you the results that you want than for me to be spending a lot of my time on the ward or having to dedicate an individual to be on the ward all the time. And a nurse practitioner is a lot cheaper than me being on the ward and it was certainly a lot cheaper than a hospitalist to be on the ward. So we, in fact, have funding for two nurse practitioners, but we only have one because we can't find a second one. We've been looking for a long time. We can't find somebody else. So we have one nurse practitioner. We also have fellows. So we have a lot of fellows. We have more fellows than residents now. We pay the fellows extra to cover the patients on the ward on weekends and on evenings. So we pay them $2,000 a week uh, on top of their salary to go see the patients and cover for the nurse practitioner. And that's a relatively small price to pay for efficiency. Uh, the internist is paid fee for service, not by the hospital. So the hospital loves it because they don't have to pay anything for him. He bills outside of the hospital system and he's perfectly happy. And they're perfectly happy because they don't have to pay him. So we'll have to close this here, but we'll have a chance for about uh, 30 minutes to gather outside or possibly on the floor above to have a little private um, uh, discussion with Bess. Bess, thank you so much. Thanks very much awesome for having lecture, me. Awesome lecture, great visionary. I love your hatred of inefficiency.